And we begin with today's top story, China, again, with a number of major developments. Reports now say the country is open to accepting a partial trade deal this week and is willing to buy an extra $10 billion worth of U.S. goods in return for no more tariffs. China also hitting back at the administration's decision to impose visa sanctions on some Chinese individuals now. They're calling the move a mistake and saying it violates international relations, announcing they'll consider implementing their own visa restrictions. All of that and now China criticizing Apple for a featured app in its app store. How does all of this play out as negotiators sit down in Washington? Joining me now are Riva Gujan, vice president of global analysis at Stratfor, and James Lucier is managing director at Capital Alpha Partners. James, I'll, I'll just begin with you. Um, the, it looked uh, for the last couple of days as if the news flow was setting us up for a disappointment. Uh, how much do you, uh, faith do you put on the reports today that China is still open to a partial deal? Look, the trade talks are now about democracy, human rights, and free speech. The Chinese won't change their system. They want us to change ours. They've been pitching the idea that they're open to a deal for three years now, and in the last couple of weeks, the state media has been saying that there is a deal ready for the Americans if they'll accept it. This spit about Liu He coming to Washington with reduced expectations is exactly that. He's trying to lower the bar to make a mini deal that is basically soybeans for tariff relief seem acceptable. We'll buy $10 billion worth of soybeans. Which is we'll nothing. We'll you that. We yeah. want you to go away. Yeah, exactly. ten, I mean, $10 billion worth of soybeans is... Is a, a pebble uh, in terms of what we're talking about here. Should the U.S. accept uh, that kind of olive branch? Well, I think investors need to understand that there are deep structural problems here across the board. It's not simply the so-called seven deadly sins of which IP theft figures prominently. It's great power competition across the board, and it's about the compatibility of two different systems. If we cannot let NBA employees make a tweet about Hong Kong, if Apple can't sell Hong Kong-related apps, if any comment about China is taken adversely, if they expect us to turn a blind eye at the way they're roping Uyghurs into concentration camps in western China, they don't understand our system. Uh, again, their message, will change nothing, but we'll buy some soybeans. Uh, that's just not going to fly, I don't Riva, think. Should, so we see the markets up, you know, about 200 points today as they continue to look and react to every positive incremental trade headline as if it's the sign of some major breakthrough or maybe it's just quelling fears that more tariffs are coming. Uh, but again, as James is saying, it doesn't sound like much, if anything, is, is changing here. Is it just the relief that there might not be more tariffs, which, as we've seen in the past, can be pretty short lived? Exactly. I mean, it's a very temporal situation. And, and look at the concessions that China is offering here. Agricultural purchases, even if we get to energy purchases, these were things that China was doing even before this trade war started. So these were always the easy, low-hanging fruit in these trade talks. So really, another ceasefire. We've been there. We've done that. And you see the White House in this kind of incessant search for additional leverage as it's trying to deliver on its promises to the American people to show that this trade war has been worth it, that the economic damage has been worth it. And so that, that search for leverage is now going into more and more extreme territory. There can always be further tariff increases um, and, and additional tariffs, but now we're talking more about that strategic decoupling argument, right. which has strong national security undertones and much bigger market impact. So I would say that there is little cause for market relief right Do now. You, this is the narrowest of a narrow deal. Yeah, Reva, we're going to talk more about this in a little bit later, but do you have a sense if, if there this is a strategic decoupling, it's hard to see how it's not, what market, it, market impact that should have? Well, so obviously the performance of the U.S. economy is, is the chief issue for President Trump going into the 2020 election right. season. So I think there will be restraint when it comes to major market disruptions caused by, for example, the idea of delisting Chinese firms from U.S. exchanges. But look at the first step, right? The idea of preventing or restricting American pension funds from mm -hmm. investing in Chinese firms, that's pretty politically bulletproof. What U.S. Congress member is going to argue with this idea of protecting government workers from firms that support the Chinese Communist Party, right? So 
what's notable here is that I think we're going to take the first step yeah. in terms of capital controls, and that should still be very unnerving for yeah. the markets. And that's an issue that extends beyond Trump in 2020. Absolutely. And I said, we'll, we'll talk more about this later. But while I have you both here, because you're such experts on the issue, I, I absolutely want to ask about the frightening scenario that's playing out right now uh, in Syria as Turkey has launched an offensive there. Um, James Lucier, nobody thinks this is a good idea except the president. Uh, it's terrifying as, as we all have to kind of sit by and, and, and watch how this plays out. I understand the president doesn't want to lose lives overseas fighting battles uh, interminably, but what happens if we lose lives here because there's a resurgence of ISIS? Well, that's true. I think there is a united bipartisan consensus against the president's position. The U.S. is in a bad position here. On the other hand, if you look in the long term, if you follow the Jacksonian theme of American foreign policy, as Walter Russell Mead mentioned in his column this morning in the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. public really does want to get out of these so-called endless wars. I just wish that the president had found a different area to make this statement. Syria is a place where removing a relatively small U.S. presence can lead to tremendous carnage. and. Um, you know, I think that while the American public may want to get out of the Middle East, this is simply not the place to start. Reva, I'll also give you a, a word on this. We watch the usual kind of market signs for geopolitical fallout, oil prices being up, maybe, you know, pricing in more of a risk premium in that regard. But frankly, there's, there's probably not much of an impact. Uh, will this reverberate more politically, or is James right that he, this is what the public's appetite has become? So what I would point to is that as you're, the U.S. is trying to deal with great power competitors like China, like Russia, of course it has a strategic need to extricate itself from these Middle Eastern conflicts. But apart from Syria, which has little economic impact by large, look at the situation still with Iran. The U.S. still has a massive deterrence dilemma on its hands. Iran still has every interest in escalating further, especially at a point where Saudi spare capacity and redundancy has been reduced significantly. So Iran now has the proven capability to essentially hold a global economy hostage. And if it wants to break that sanction stalemate, it has to escalate to get to a negotiation to de-escalate. And that is still a big part of the Iranian game. So I would not take your eyes off the Persian Gulf conflict in particular. Oh, that's an excellent point. Guys, thank you both. Appreciate it today. Riva Gujan of Stratfor and James Lucier of Capital Alpha Partners.